So our first speaker this afternoon is Professor Wendelin Werner. He is the recipient of the 2006 Fields Medal. And his topic today would, was about when randomly chosen objects surprise us. So I'm personally very interested to find out more about that. And thereafter, we'll have the Q&A as usual. It will be moderated by Professor Philip Harms over here. Without further ado, Professor, please. Thank you, everyone. Um, I hope the microphone is on and you can hear me. Yeah, OK, now it is. Um, so uh, it is always a big responsibility uh, for us scientists who you know, have been just working on our science and then uh, have to speak in front of an audience of uh, young, lots of long, young brains about uh, we're looking for uh, you know, advice or, uh, uh, and we are, don't feel necessarily that qualified to you know, provide a, uh, uh, advice about, especially uh, in, for you who are, you know, uh, have to shape the world of tomorrow, whereas uh, uh, the world I knew, and I grew up with, has uh, changed dramatically in, in these last uh, decades. So, what I learned uh, might not be applicable anymore. Uh, so it's always a, uh, a question about, you know, what am I going to, what, what are the main messages that I'm going to want to convey? And the other thing is, um, you know, I'm, I understand probably the first of the couple of mathematicians that you will hear uh, in this uh, GYSS here. And, um, there are two things. Uh, the first one is that <coughs> somehow the bar is set quite low for mathematicians to, you know, the expectations are not that great in terms of what are, you know, we're going to hear a talk by mathematicians. So if, unless you are a mathematician yourself, you say, okay, well, uh, probably we're not going to understand anything, and, uh, but it will be interesting to see a, a curious beast. Um, uh, to some extent, of course, there, there is a problem because uh, it's very difficult for us to, you know, talk to you about what we actually do, uh, you know, the, the content of the math that we try to think about. So the usual way is just to talk about something else, you know, about, uh, you know, uh, how, when, when is it that we had an idea instead of talking about the idea itself or... Uh, explaining that we are uh, somehow different, you know, that we function maybe in a slightly different way than uh, our friends in, in the, you know, other sciences where, uh, you know, uh, funding and groups uh, thing is more essential, whereas we tend to say, well, what really we want is time to think and not many people around. Uh, which is not exactly necessarily, you know, uh, the, the usual uh, thing you tell to fundings, uh, funding bodies. And, uh, uh, but uh, today I'll just try a different challenge, and the different challenge is really to talk to you about actual mathematics. So uh, instead of making the usual, I mean, somewhat usual for me, uh, thing about uh, how mathematics uh, uh, storytelling. I'll try to just give you a few examples of uh, instances where uh, when you choose a mathematical object, so we'll discuss three examples, numbers, functions, or uh, topographic shapes at random, uh, the outcome uh, of what you choose, what you get, typically will be a type of object that might actually be very new for you and very uh, unexpected. And uh, I hope this might stimulate your imagination on different direction, depending on your background. Uh, and uh, I'll come back to that uh, uh, in a moment. The other thing is that um, you probably remember, or maybe not because you are too young, that. Uh, before computers and Beamer PowerPoint presentation uh, became the norm, um, you know, lecture halls used to have blackboards or whiteboards, I mean, then turned into whiteboards, and that we mathematicians used to love that because blackboards, you know, that looks like uh, 
more adapted to mathematics. And there's actually a good reason for which we tend to still not be very fond of PowerPoint presentation, which is that, you know, the mathematics is just something that goes on in our own brain. And having things, you know, structured on, a, on you know, presented in a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a Beamer presentation a certain way with certain colors and certain implications and, you know, visual uh, thing like that uh, is, you know, removes to each of your brains, you know, the ability to, you know, put it in the right, uh, organize it in the right way. Uh, and uh, some, that's one aspect. And the other aspect is, of course, that uh, we can't process more than, you know, one mathematical thought at a time. And when there's too much information on the, on the, on, on the PowerPoint slide, uh, we just can't process it. So I will, you know, for some time, you, we were stuck with PowerPoint presentation because that was the only option. But now we have these nice tablets and uh, we can, you know, use blackboards, uh, you know, <laughs> again uh, on, on PowerPoint presentations, even though it requires a bit of uh, exercise. And just a, a little comment uh, is also that mo many mathematicians, and that's what I do, don't like the, you know, the, the commercial uh, you know, software that is provided and like open source uh, things and work on Linux. And this, the best available um, uh, uh, software for presentation that I'm going to use for you, for, ma for us mathematicians, is, has actually been written by a very good, strong, one of the best mathematicians in the earth, uh, called Denis Oroux, who is a professor in symplectic geometry at MIT. And he said, uh, okay, well, I don't like what is available, so I write my own software. And that's what he did. And that's we are, now we can use it. So that's cool. Uh, all right. All right. Uh, so, the other thing is I'm very bad at keeping uh, time under control. I remember that um, when I arrived at Zurich, which, as you know, is very rigid uh, with time, uh, I somehow traumatized uh, students when I told them that my grad course uh, in Paris that I used to um, uh, have organized had the following schedule on Fridays. We start at 9. Okay, if, if we need a, a lunch break, tell me about it. And uh, <laughs> if you need a tea at 4 p.m., we can also make a break. And we stop whenever we feel we are too tired. So, of course, now having, you know, conveying three ideas into uh, 30 minutes is a bit of a challenge for, for me, but I'll try to uh, do my best. So, the first uh, little story I want to tell you about is just the simplest one that already got many mathematicians confused by the, you know, around the beginning of the 20th century, or um, uh, you, you might know that that was, you know, the time, or, you know, like 1920 or 1930, where logic had, you know, all these uh, big questions about what is provable, what is not provable, the axiom of choice. And in parallel, you had all these quantum mechanics questions about, you know, what is real, what is not real, what can one observe, what can one not observe, and so on. And in parallel to that, and that really was paralleling that, there was this question, re, you know, revolving about what it means to choose a number at random between zero and one, right? Choosing, uh, so the mathematical word has to do with the Lebesgue measure uh, type stories, but that's something that is very, uh, at least very simple to understand for everyone. You know, you have an interval of length one, and you just pick a point in the interval uniformly at random. So typically it could be, you know, uh, you choose a time completely at random and then you assume that you are able to measure, you know, time at infinite precisions. That's what it means. So you know all the digits of, you know, that are involved in choosing that time. So Typically, well, you write this number in digits and it will start, so it's between zero and one, it will start with like seven, nine, eight, I don't know, okay, that's not a good idea because I started on the left, so something like that. Right, so it's a, it's a sequence of digits like this. And one of the first, so it's pretty clear that the choice of the first digit will be depending if you're on the first tenth interval on the left, and the second tenth, the third tenth, and so on. 
the choice of the second digit will depend if you are, you know, say for instance here you are between, uh, you know, one, two, three, like this. So you are somewhere here between the 0 0.2 and 0 0.3. So now you know, you have discovered this. You know you are here, and now you're going to divide this into ten subintervals and choose which in which one you are, and that will de decide what your second digit is and so on. Right. So you're subdividing, you know the information about where this randomly chosen point is, uh, you know, subsequentially. So in some sense, it's clear that choosing a number between zero and one at random is like choosing a sequence of digits uniformly at random. So the first one, you choose the first digit among the 10 options, and then the second digit among the 10 options, and you do that uh, uniformly at random for all the digits. And there's a very, uh, you know, one of the first results you hear about uh, probability theory, which is called the law of large numbers, tell you that when you do that, you have the sequence of numbers. Morally speaking, the average number of times at which you find digit 1 is going to be 1 over 10. Right? So if you look at the first million of digits, the average number of times you found a 1 uh, in that outcome will be getting closer and closer to 1 tenth when the million goes to infinity. That's the law of large numbers. So a typically chosen number will have the property that the average numbers of ones is going to be one-tenth, the average number of zeros is going to be one-tenth, and that's true for every digit. So any randomly chosen number will have that property. Now, of course, there are special numbers that don't have that property. 0 0.5, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 doesn't have that property, but this one will, you know, will not be chosen at random because it's a very special number. Now, do you know many numbers that have this property that, you know, the average number you know, of digits uh, of zeros or one or twos or three is always one tenth? So you say, yeah, I know that. I know one is zero point one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, one, two, three, four. You know, you continue like that, then clear you force it to have an average uh, number of digits to be one tenth for each of the digits. Now, why do we use these digits, 10 digits? Because we have 10 fingers. That's how we learned how to, 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 to count. So you could, instead of subdividing you know, by 10 at each step, you could sort of decide to subdivide by 2 and write your numbers in binary form, meaning that you know, this same point, which was here, at first step is on the left, so it starts with a zero. Second step, it's on the right, so you subdivide by two, it's a one. Third step, uh, it's on the left, so it's a zero, and so on. Right? So instead of replacing 10 by two, you write your same number in binary form, and then it's a sequence of zero and ones that you have. And again, you know the average number of zeros should be one half, the average number of ones should be one half in your expansion. So that means that if I choose a number at random in the interval 0, 1, it will have the following property. For whatever choice of number of fingers you're using, that we like to call a basis, the, you know, say if you have B possible options, so you write in basis B, so here this is basis 2, or this was basis 10, the average number of times at which digit A shows up is going to be 1 over B, right? So in binary form, you have, in average, half of the digits will be 0, half of the digits will be 1, and in basis 10, 1 tenth of... But this has to be true for every basis. Now the question, can you give me... So an example of a number that has that property. So... So you think, yeah, you know, let's, you know, weird numbers like pi or e, you know, they should have that property. And then I'm going to tell you, yes, probably it's true, but show me that it's true. That if you take pi, uh, that uh, in any dig, you know, in any basis, pi will have that property. And then you'll scratch your head and say, well, um, I still think it's true that pi is, has this property, but I won't be able to show it to you prove it to you because it looks very difficult. I need to think hard about it. So, to make a long story short, 
There are just a couple of numbers for which mathematicians have been able to prove that they have that property. Because all the numbers that you know of, right, these could be pi, e, integral from 0, 1 of something, or you know, some, some formulas, they, have, they are very special numbers. They are numbers that have, some, you know, have been produced, not at random at all. And to prove that these numbers have that property, it's like uh, very complicated. So that's the first instance where something, a number chosen at random has a certain property. But if I tell you, produce me one example of numbers that had that property that almost all numbers have, you won't be able to find. Right? So this is sort of the first you know, simple example of the fact that, yeah, the objects we know, the numbers we know that we gave a name to, pi or even a formula, right, integral between 0 and 1 of this and that, they are all very special, precisely because they, they had a number, you know, they had a name, or we can, you know, write them, and, and that makes them very different what a, you know, typical number is. So something chosen typically at random will not necessarily be, uh, you know, the uh, the objects you have encountered before. Now, my second example has to do with random functions. So now we all learn, you know, the first things we learn at school in mathematics, not first thing, but, you know, advanced mathematics is stories about functions. You know, you have this like that, and you are looking at a something like that, t, and here you have f of t, or something like that. That's to each time t, you associate uh, f of t, and this f can be continuous, right? So it's like an evolution in time, which doesn't have jumps. And usually we, you know, draw it like that. That's the way it's, you know, what a typical function looks like. But now the question is, okay, choose one continuous function among all possible continuous functions at random. What does it look like? Well, again, I have to cut a very long story short, but the long story, I mean, the, the story is the following. What you do is choosing a function at random. One way to start with is to do a, what we like to call a simple random walk, which is at each step, you choose whether to go up or down with probability one half, right? That way you just you know, go up, down, up, 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 and so on. But then you want this function to, you know, uh, to be, uh, you, know, you don't want it, you know, to, to go up and down by, you know, during time interval one, we want to sort of to get to some natural limit. And the natural limit is this object that we get here, which is what we like to call Brown in motion. All right. So that's um, Brown in motion. And there are a number of ways to justify the fact that, in some sense, this is the natural way, one natural way, to choose at random a continuous function. And you probably have seen these type of functions before, if you, you know, look at, uh, you know, uh, science, say, the, uh, how you call that, a stock uh, market uh, evolution, you see these very irregular type things, which still look like they are continuous functions. And uh, my moderator here knows much more than I do about financial mathematics. Um, anyway, so this is like what we like to think about being a randomly chosen uh, uh, function. This is, and it is, requires some mathematical work, you know, at the level of grad school to explain that what this, that this act object actually exists that the Brownian motion is indeed a randomly chosen continuous function, that it is continuous, and that it has, uh, and, and to be able to, to study it and work with it. Now, what I want to tell you now is that this randomly chosen continuous function is a type of continuous function that you've never seen before, probably, if you are, unless you are, you know, uh, mathematicians who like, uh, you know, uh, strange uh, mathematical beasts. So the first remark is that the Brownian motion, this curve here that you is drawn, is oscillating a lot at every infinitesimal level, right? So it's, it's sort of this 
goes up and down a bit all the time, infinitesimally, so at each scale level you have this thing, it goes up and down. So in particular, it means that this blue curve here will have infinite length. So if you really try to draw, follow a Brownian motion with your pen, starting from left to right, following this, this blue curve, well, unless you're using a tablet, like I do, you will run out of ink after time zero. Because immediately you go up and down so much at infinitesimal level that the length of what you're doing is infinite. Right? So this is not at all a type of function that you are used to, like a smooth function, which has a derivative, right? When you know the length is just the integral of the derivative or according to time and things like that. This is not at all this type of object you are used to. This is going to be a function that is as differential nowhere, you know, so it will be very, very irregular, has this infinite length. All right? So that's just one example of something uh, that you get, we choose a randomly chosen function. Well, it's a type of function that you have never seen before and that you didn't really think about that. Uh, this is a generic case that these functions, usually the way is, you know, the simple functions are the ones we know, they are the ones which are differentiable and the ones which have, uh, you know, infinite length. These are the pathological things that only mathematicians care about, but actually, no, it's, these are the, you know, uh, 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 generic ones. Now, I'm going to tell you a story which is now more advanced, but it's sort of more um, uh, that I like to tell uh, in my grads uh, uh, story, and I'm going to do it with a little, with, a, with my uh, a drawing. So now what I want you to think about is that this line, this green line, is the real line where the brown motion is moving. So it moves from left to right like this, right, horizontally. And what we're going to do is that on the top, you know, this brownie motion is going to carry a pack of sand, which has a hole puncture. So it leaves some trace behind it. Uh, and somehow, after some time, it will have left a sand pile behind it. And the height of the sand pile at each point will sort of reflect how much time the Brownian motion spent at that point. So let me, before doing the example for the Brownian motion, imagine that you, you do the same thing. You start at zero and you go to the right with your punctured sand, sand pile. Well, after a certain time you are here, you go to the right at constant speed. So what will happen is that the sand pile will look like that. Right behind you, it has a certain height, wherever you've been. And because you went at constant speed, this height is constant. And then here is zero, zero. Is that clear? And it, you continue moving to the right, and then a bit later, the sand pile will look like that. That's what happens if you move to the right at constant speed. So you see that here, the sand pile necessarily has the property that the sand pile profile is not continuous because it makes a jump here. On the other hand, the Brownian motion is moving, you know, like crazy, like that. And what happens is that at every time, if you look at the sand pile that you have obtained, it will be a nice continuous shape. Right? So what you get is that the Brownian motion. if it moves on top of the sand pile it has constructed in the past, is going to create always you know, a continuous sand pile, which we like to call local time for probabilists. And, and then again, there's the question, do you know any function that has this property that at any time the sand pile in construct is actually without you know, discontinuity? And the answer is, uh, I don't think you'll be able to produce me a single one that has that property. Uh, this is just what brown motion is doing, a typically chosen function will have that property and it will be very difficult for you to find you anyone with that particular property. A further example is that this gives you an example of something very strange. And the very strange thing is, well, it's not that strange because we all did that as kids. 
you know, we're given a piece of pen and you have to color a sheet of paper. And usually, you know, you do that as a small kid and you color, you know, shapes in blue or something, or I don't know, some dragons and, you know, you have some, you have to color with your piece of pen a, a surface and you do it like that and okay, and then after some point you realize it's not the most interesting activity and you want to actually learn to write or something like that. But they just tricked you to how to learn how to hold a pen or something like that. Uh, but here now the, the job is the, the following. The pen I gave you is infinitesimal, right? It doesn't have any thickness. And I asked you to draw, to color a piece of surface in a finite time using this pen, which actually only visits points and doesn't have any thickness. So what I'm asking you is find a curve that moves around in two-dimensional space and that visits all the points, right? A space-filling curve. And this example here is actually one, because if I, this thing is moving around like that, filling, you know, creating the sand pile after some, and after some time, the sand pile will reach at that point here, will reach that level. And so that means that at some point, the point at which the sand pile did reach that level, this brown emotion, which was growing on top of the sand pile, past sand pile, was visiting that point. That's true for every point. So this way, you have constructed a way, uh, you know, function that actually fills in the entire plane. Exactly, again, an example of something you wouldn't expect, you know, to be possible at all, to find just one of these space-filling curves. So a function chosen uniformly at random, the Brownian motion, and if you add this little tweak with the sand pile thing, provides for you a way to fill in space uh, with a, you know, with a curve. All right. So now what I want to say a bit further is that Brownian motion is not only interesting for people interested in stock markets, it's actually a fundamental building block to understand a number of things that have related to most elementary physics. You probably all know Newton's law has to do with, you know, one over r squared interactions, a potential uh, one over r, and this is very closely related to, you know, harmonic functions, the Laplacian, uh, and Brownian motion is behind the scenes as well. So, in particular, uh, Brownian motion is interesting uh, not only as this one-dimensional curve like that, but as an object that moves around in space. Right? So, this is a random trajectory, if you want, of something that you could view as a little fly that has no memory and is sort of oscillating around. It has infinite speed, but of course, because it changes its mind all the time, it has no sense of where it goes, no direction, but it sort of moves around in an isotropic way, completely erratic. Right? This is this brown emotion, dimension two or three, uh, that you can uh, view like this. What happens is that if you, you know, the three coordinates in, of a three-dimensional brown emotion would be actually three independent one-dimensional brown emotion, which were the previous curve that we did draw when you look at it with respect to time. So, what sort of trajectory is a two-dimensional Brownian motion? Well, you just do a little simulation, and you know this, this is what a trajectory of a two-dimensional Brownian motion looks like. So again, this is sort of a, a very strange beast because, in some sense, you should view it as having infinite energy, right? It's sort of a, it's not moving around like like crazy, but, but because it's not organized enough, it still remains around and moves continuously around you, but it has this infinite energy in it that it try, uh, tries to, to, to organize. Now, if you look at the trajectory of a two-dimensional two Brownian motion, it will have properties that you would never have expected a continuous curve could have. So that would be, again, something uh, essential. So just to give you an example, during time, on the time interval between 0 and 1, there will be a point somewhere. Of course, it's a very special point on the trajectory that this Brownian motion will have visited infinitely many times. 
So during the finite time interval 0, 1, there will be a point that the Brownian motion will have visited infinitely often. And these points will be actually you know, spread all over the trajectory. So, and again, if I try to ask you, you know, produce me a curve, you know, a two-dimensional curve with that property, you'll be very, very in deep trouble. So here we are now in a situation where, and of course I, you know, I can't elaborate more on that, but these type of very strange properties of these Brownian paths turn out to be very closely related to fundamental issues having to do with fundamental physics, because the Brownian motion is behind the scene of you know, the you know, interaction forces and Thor in physics. And so what started to look as you know, exotic thing and you know, why are you interested in these and those properties of the Brownian path? Actually, they are uh, very uh, important um, uh, elements you know, to understand uh, some, if you want to do some aspects of uh, theoretical physics. All right, so now the third example I want to uh, go into, which is the one that is more related to more modern uh, research that I've been involved in, is uh, to try to uh, define random mountains. So we all, you know, uh, have traveled you know, uh, across uh, on, on the plane somewhere, uh, looked through the window and we saw some mountains. And, or you know, geographical landscapes in general, but mountains is a good example. And, and then we look at it and said, well, okay, this looks like very, there's both a lot of organization going on and our friends uh, in geology and earth sciences will tell us all about it that it's not random at all, and so on. But still, you look at it, it looks like something you know, chose, you know, was formed using some randomness. There is some you know, random shapes going on. And so now you go into the direction of wanting to define the natural way to choose uniformly at random uh, topographic landscape. So of course, this, as opposed to the continuous functions and the numbers, defining what you call uniformly at random there, what are the constraints that you put on your topographic landscape is important. And there are sort of different ways to uh, uh, construct what you would mean, uh, you know, a uniformly chosen random landscape. But the simplest one, you know, it should combine two elements. First of all, of course, the, the height you know, the height of the, to, you know, the height at a given point should be random, right? Should be able to fluctuate. But also you don't want, you know, you're not choosing the height here and next to you completely independently because you want things to hold together, right? So you have this sort of two elements that on the one hand side, things should be allowed to fluctuate and the other side uh, there should be some sort of constraint that pulls things together. So the way I like to you know, explain this to students when I start uh, lectures in, on that type of graduate courses on that type of lecture or that type of topic is to say that the previous example of the Brownian motion, you could view it as the natural way in which a violin string would want to oscillate you know, uh, away from equilibrium if you zoom in appropriately, you will see this, you know, vertical fluctuation of the violin string. Now, instead of, if you replace your violin string by something which would be like a huge trampoline, right, attached at the boundary with height zero on the boundary, and then the inside it could sort of fluctuate, and then you, you know, with little springs, that's how trampolines are usually made of, and then you just choose one position, random position of this trampoline uh, that's going to give you, like, fluctuating heights all over. So the question now is how are you going to, what, what do you get? So a first remark I want to make is that there are different ways to try to describe a random topography. The first one would be to say, well, uh, topography is each point in a square, for instance, or in a, in, a, in a disk, has a certain height, right? That's the way you like to think about it. 
So in some sense, we are choosing a random function from that to each point in the square associates a height. That would be a way to describe your mountainous shape. Now, there would be other ways to do that, which is like the way you do it when you buy a topographic map, which is to describe your landscape via its topographic lines, right? So you have, you know, here the height is zero, there it's 10, then it's back to zero, then here is 10, then here is 20, and so on. If you buy your topographic maps that puts the height differences uh, at, you know, differences at level 10. And so you sort of see that there are different ways to uh, describe what this landscape is, uh, to encode it in a different way. The collection of level lines or, or the actual function itself. Um, so now if you do a simulation and you say, okay, I, let me try to see what happens when I look at a randomly chosen uh, you know, mountain uh, defined in the disk using the appropriate thing at a fine mesh scale and you zoom in uh, appropriately until you actually do see something, then uh, what you end up seeing uh, is something like that. So, what you sort of see with your bare eyes here, that's very rough. Right? It looks like, uh, so this is when you do a simulation on a fine grid, of your mountain, or of your, of your, um, uh, uh, you see these things with you know big spikes going up and down everywhere. And if you, if you do what uh, you know, uh, people who know how to handle simulation and uh, would know how to do it, that means that you 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 look at this picture and then you travel around with a little helicopter to see you know how it looks like from all aspects. You would see that you know the the high spikes at the top and the low spikes at the bottom they are very near to each other. And then you let the mesh of the lattice go, you know, you know, becomes smaller and smaller. And then what happens is that these spikes become higher and higher. And then what you realize uh, after some time, and that requires some mathematical work, is that actually, yes, the object, there exists a limiting object when the mesh of the lattice goes to zero. But this limiting object is not a function. It's not a continuous function. It's not a landscape in the way you thought about landscapes. So the way you want to think about it is to say, well, it is this randomly chosen object, which is the randomly random chosen you know, way to choose uh, uh, a mountain in two dimensions the natural object, and again, this one is really fundamental, absolutely fundamental for uh, quantum physics, and this is the, the most elementary building block, this random function, in, in, uh, in uh, some part of theoretical physics. I'm talking to you, you know, it has another name, like the Gaussian free field, or the free bosonic field, or, you know, this is exactly this, this object there. So it's not like just some exotic object here. Uh, you cannot code it as a random function. You can't say, if I give you, a, it's not something that to each point in the plane is going to associate a given height. That's not the way, that doesn't work. So here we have an instance where you choose at random an object in a certain class that you see, yet, that yet you think you know, the class of random functions defined in the square, continuous function. And what you end up with is something which actually is not in that class. It's something else that you didn't expect to exist at all, but a typical uniformly random chosen you know, mountainous landscape is not a mountainous landscape. That's sort of the, the outcome. It's something else. So what is it? So the clue is that there is a way to describe it, and that's what I'm going to tell you about is really research, modern research and probability theory that you know, we've been, I've been involved in it, but uh, you know, the last 10 years or so, is um, that the right way to understand this object is via the topographic map. 
And the way it goes is the following. It has the following structure. First of all, so I'm just going to give you a descriptive uh, you know, uh, picture of what this object is. First of all, there exists a very strange randomly chosen object, which you can describe easily. I mean, not easily, but you could see what type of object it is. This is just the disk with some punctures in it, like, you know, islands in the disk. The black thing is connected, right? So this is, you can travel on the black thing coming, starting from the boundary all the way to the inside. So it's just puncturing, you know, at random holes inside this uh, disk. Now, what you're going to do is that to view these holes here, instead of looking at the holes, you're just looking at these things. You know, you look at these, these, these boundaries of these holes. they will play an important role. Now, this structure that I did draw to you here has one special property, which is that actually, which is not so apparent here, which is that the black object is a fractal, meaning that if I give you any given point in the plane, I mean in this disk, it will actually be in a hole. So the black points are, have in some sense zero density in in the disk, they are, uh, and if I give you a point, it will almost surely be in a hole, but there will be always exceptional point that happen to be you know, on the black stuff. Right, so now the structure is the following. You start with the disk, you choose one of these weird objects here. So these, you describe it by collection of loops. And now you view these loops not as level lines, but at cliffs. Meaning, on the outside of the loop, the height is zero, and on the inside of the loop, the height is either plus 10 or minus 10. And you do that independently at random for each of the loops. So it's like a little podium, you know, you go up by 10 or down by 10. And outside, you are, if you're outside of all the loops, you are at height zero. And then inside of each loop, you are going to repeat the same procedure that you're going to punch new holes here. And again, for each of these green things, you decide independently whether you go up by 10 or down by 10 compared to the height you had inside. So here, for instance, the level two loops here, you will either be plus 20 or back to zero at the two steps. And then you iterate that all the way to uh, infinity by adding more loops inside loops and inside loops and inside loops, and, you, and, if, and you're at random. Now, if I give you, choose a given point that I started, you know, that if I start a typical point here, what you will see is that the, this typical point will be, you know, surrounded by infinitely many loops, because at each step it will almost surely be inside a loop. So a given point will be surrounded by infinitely many cliffs, each cliff go up or down with probability one half. So that means that the height of this particular point doesn't make any sense because it's just the limit of this random walk which goes up and down, the height of, of the different cliffs that are surrounding it. So the height of that point doesn't make any sense. On the other hand, in this way, by this you know, nested sequence of all these cliffs, you have described an object that looks like a something like a random mountain, and it is possible to show that this object that I've constructed in this way, if you choose this particular way of choosing these cliff lines, is actually a de fair description of this Gaussian free field, which is this randomly, uniformly chosen mountainous landscape. So the idea is this mountainous landscape has a strange property, which is that it's plus minus infinity everywhere, the height, but still there's a way to organize things uh, in order to, you know, uh, deconstruct it uh, in a way that we can make sense of and describe. So, of course, I just finished at ETH a graduate course on the Gaussian free field, right? And it took me something like uh, 50 hours of lectures, and the students are very good. Uh, 
And uh, I could see that now the exam is going to arrive soon. The number of registered students who want to pass the exam has dropped significantly uh, because they view this as a difficult one. Uh, and this description that I just gave to you with this uh, height like that is out of the scope of this particular grad course. It's too, you know, that would be for two more graduate course before. So what I want to say is not that it's difficult, it's, not, it's more that uh, you had no chance, right? I'm not expecting you to have understood anything precise about this Gaussian free field topographic map, except you know, some, you know, stimulating your imagination in some way uh, that, you know, uh, might, you know, lead your brain, uh, resonate with some other things you have seen. It's the type of thing, you know, on the spot you see, oh yeah, yeah, and then you go out of the room and say, what did he talk about again? Um, and of course, the reason is also that the number of things that I had to, you know, be very sloppy about and not precise, and mathematicians don't like to do that, but of course, given the time constraint that wasn't any other uh, possible way to do that. So this is just to illustrate the fact that, you know, we are been dealing, you know, in our research with these very strange, funny random fractals, uh, uh, objects, and these are conform conformal loop ensembles. There are not that many people in the world who, you know, know what these are and uh, would be able to construct them rigorously, but we very much like each other, the, <laughs> this little group of people who do, and because we like this, playing with these things. But also to emphasize the fact that it is really related to really fundamental questions. It's not like exotic things. Fundamental question about how to understand, uh, you know, uh, basic, basic building blocks in physics and what is a, what is a boson and uh, these type of things that you learn at very, you know, early on in physics courses that bosons have the property that they are indistinguishable or these type of things. You know, how do you make sense of that uh, if you really want to, to scrap uh, beyond the surface? But more generally, there is this idea that, you know, you have these three layers in the, of, of possible surprises that you get when you uh, want to study an object chosen at random in a very, very large set. Uh, and this large, last layer is the thing, you know, you choose an object uniformly at random in a class A you think understand very well, and then you realize that actually the randomly chosen object is not in class A, it's in something larger. And, you know, a randomly chosen mountain is not a mountain. And, of course, you know, you, you, know, you have had things about exoplanets and, you know, all these things. And we, we all think, you know, we're surrounded by lots of things that uh, uh, have example of instances of things chosen somehow at random. But, of course, we are the observers, so we are somewhere where <laughs> the thing we observe around us is maybe not, you know, the standard uniformly chosen one because we are actually here to observe it. And, you know, you could go on and on to try to, to, to uh, elaborate on, on these type of examples. But of course, we mathematicians, are, we are very modest. We just say, you know, for these specific examples, these are, you know, uh, this is what happens. And there's this general idea that when you mix randomness with infinite sets, uh, you know, you can be surprised, and even our very clever friends in theoretical physics could be surprised uh, as well, because some, some elements of this mixture between randomness and continuous are really uh, counterintuitive. Um, all right. Uh, there are, in, in contemporary mathematics, this general theme of choosing a mathematical object at random is really uh, something that is around a lot. Uh, I chose the examples of two, you know, numbers and functions, and because this is something that everybody could understand. If I tell you I choose at random a group, uh, I would have to define what a group is, and I have to, you know, choose, explain you how, how this works. But that's again, you know, what a typical random group is uh, is also a very, you know, sensible question to ask from a mathematical perspective. Um, and if you look at, you know, the work of, say, Manjul Bhargava, who's working on the, you know, some of the most abstract mathematics about, you know, prime numbers, elliptic functions, and something like that, you know, his, one of his main results is, you know, 100%, you know, the proportion of elliptic curves satisfying these or that properties is actually 100%, meaning that a randomly chosen elliptic curve will have certain properties. So it is, you know, this type of theme is something which is not... Uh, uh, 
uh, uh, it's not specific to you know, certain questions. It's a very natural way to proceed if you have a class that you don't understand well, try to understand what a typical element, randomly chosen element in that class is. Okay, so I, I see that my time is out. I don't know by how much, but um, I will stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Werner. I think we will just have a very short Q&A session that Professor Harms will be moderating. The idea is that you join us. So um, we'll have uh, a very limited amount of time for questions, but is there anybody in the audience here who would like to um, ask a question? Yes, here. Uh, I mean, the, the way things happen is that um, it's, a, it's a little bit the same story as when you choose uh, a point uh, uniformly at random in the interval 0, 1. If I give you a specific point in advance, you know it will not be chosen. Right? Because that's too, it's just at 0% of falling exactly there. So this black structure, right, this black fractal that I defined before, has zero area. It's random and has zero area. And because it has zero area, it has the property that if I give you a given point, the probability that it will be in that black thing will be zero because the thing is too thin. That's what I had in mind. Therefore, it is in the hole. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's very, it's well known that it's very hard and very little knowledge about it. And uh, one reason I can think of is that it's compared to the simple random walk, which can be modeled by yeah. uh, maybe a okay. binomial process. And the, the self avoiding walk doesn't have any model to fit in. But is there any other, other reason why it is very hard? And okay. actually, so I, you are working the stochastic loner evolution. Really it's the mean to use for it. So I actually okay, so, so uh, usually I give long answers to questions, but I, in that case I will give a very short one, which is that your question is uh, not related to what I discussed, but what you read about what I did before. So I'd rather not answer to your question here, but uh, um, uh, because most of the audience wouldn't really see what, what it is about. The general question is that you know there are ways to choose at random curves with some constraints, which would be the curve is not allowed to self-intersect and things like that, and that's things that we'd like to look at, and these are very difficult questions, but it's not directly related to what I said here, so maybe I'll just postpone the answer to some other Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm just so interested. No worries. Thanks. Maybe um, there's one uh, more broad Hi. question that uh, I got uh, from online, and that would also be a nice way of wrapping things up. Maybe the question is how can uh, non-mathematicians, but the scientists working in other disciplines, uh, profit from the, from the logic and creativity of mathematicians? Would you like to comment on this? Um. <laughs> it's... We, we function, it's true that we function somewhat differently, but I don't think that we are that uh, different, of course, because, you know, the way we choose our, you know, careers and things like that uh, is a bit, you know, we chose to go into math rather than into in physics. Uh, in my case, uh, you know, I don't think there was any deep reason why. I, so when I talk to my, <laughs> to my friends in physics, um, the answer is no there. Uh, uh, I, well, actually, maybe, uh, maybe yes, because I had a very, very nice school, a primary, uh, teacher at primary school who did teach us how to do, how to trick this. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we are how we are. We try to, one thing that, that is, I think, common among mathematicians, that we try to be very honest and try to be very authentic and remain true to our, you know, 
uh, ways of uh, functioning and uh, to say um, uh, also there's one aspect about mathematics is that uh, still you know it's a little bit like a, a sport brain sport uh, and as you know you know the world champion in chess after you know Carlson now uh, at age uh, in his early 30s say you know I'm getting too old you know the younger ones are faster than me and um, so of course there are ways to compensate you can be a very good mathematician when you grow older but you always have are humbled by the fact that you know the, the younger people always come and they will run faster than you very very quickly and so that our one of our you know uh, we have to be remain modest and you pass the button to the younger generation uh, early on so you know when we tell you about the old stories how it was I discovered this and this whatever that uh, in mathematics is you know the young students will say okay I read your paper I understood it what next you know I, I want to you know continue and start where you where, where you left it and uh, so 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 all these things we try to be you know authentic and honest about things that uh, one important thing is this general idea that you know among us right we know that these things with prizes and genius or you know because sometimes from the outside world the mathematicians you know fields medals sort of comes with some aura of uh, something special okay among us in the community we know that's just you know, this PR machine you know to have some people which end up you know being here and having to tell you uh, something but we are a group of large group of people who like doing what we want to do uh, what we're doing and chose to do that rather than to uh, uh, earn a lot of money uh, doing something else uh, and we're happy with that and uh, we know what we're talking about and when we're between us we know that there's nothing more into it than you know, what we're talking about and I think that just maybe just be authentic like that is always just the best thing we can show to the outside world and also to our friends in in other uh, parts of sciences uh, yeah uh, so the creativity part is I mean you know it's not specific to maths it's everywhere there's always this moment where at some point you need to try out something and and goes in your brain and it's also not necessarily in science in every day's you know everybody's life we have to be creative in making our life choices and that's just the uh, way uh, life is mm. i think unfortunately we need to wrap it up um it uh, was great let's give an applause to vandalin <laughs> <laughs>